Well, good morning, church family. Hey, doesn't this place look awesome? It looks absolutely amazing. Thank you to all of you who've worked so diligently to transform our campus into an atmosphere that is so engaging and appropriate for Vacation Bible School because we just want to reach the next generation with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, as we continue our walk through the book of Acts, if you do not have a Bible with you this morning, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that and make that your own as a gift from us to you, okay? Mark in it. That is yours now as a gift, okay? Have you ever been at a fork in the road of life and you are scared out of your mind? Yeah? Have you ever been there with major decisions, right? What is my major in college? Who should I marry? Should we have kids? What if I miss God's will for my life and mess the whole thing up? Have you ever been there? For me, one of those key, pivotal, really scary moments was was when I was graduating college and I had multiple job offers in front of me. Multiple jobs in different cities with kind of different career paths and, and I was frightened because I I could see, like, this is the trajectory for the rest of my life. Well, what if I mess this up? What if I don't find God's will and pick the right choice? And just kind of filled with anxiousness and, and fear, how do you discern God's will in those moments when when there are seemingly endless decisions or paths? right in front of you. As we get to the critical moment of today's passage, we we will see exactly that. Here is Paul and Silas and Timothy, and they are right on the edge trying to figure out which way do we go. And I want us to see as we work through this text how God's spirit leads them, okay? So you hold your spot in Acts 16. You guys pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we begin by simply saying we trust you, God. We trust you and your word. You are a father who has given your son for us. Help us as we think through the difficulty of life's decision and and which door and path you are opening. God, give us wisdom for how to process all of that, but ultimately, above it all, lift our eyes to focus on you with the constant assurance you are our Father. We believe that. We trust it this morning. God, meet with your children. We pray that your spirit Spirit, God, would give us discernment and wisdom and understanding that comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul and Barnabas have split in a fury. You remember that from last week. And and Barnabas is going to leave with John Mark, and they're going to head to Cyprus. And Paul leaves on his own from Antioch. He sends word to Silas, and Silas will join him in Galatia, in that region. In that region. But Paul is going off on his own now, and he sets off and he wants to revisit the churches that him and Barnabas had planted on their first missionary journey. Now recall that he had written a letter to them addressing Very important theological issue that was going on in that region, okay? And that is, must believers, born-again believers, must they follow the Mosaic law, okay? And and this was uh, the issue that had gone on in Antioch and the, the Jerusalem council. And so it was during that time that he wrote back to them the letter that we know as Galatians, And and if you will recall, that letter is is 
potent. It is a fiery letter, okay? Uh, in it, he actually says, listen, th those of you that insist on circumcision, I wish you would go and mutilate yourselves. Woo! That is intense, okay? And so, pastorally, you can understand that Paul longs to get back with the people to, to see their faces and, and to hug their necks and to connect with them. Let them hear his voice, okay? And so, he is anxious to get back with them. Now, verse four of chapter 16 tells us that he is carrying with him a signed letter from James and the apostles, carrying the decision of the Jerusalem council that no, you, might, you don't have to keep the Mosaic law as a Christian. And when he connects with them, he's, he's gonna tell them about how, how this issue had spread in Antioch and how he went and they had the Jerusalem council and, and now how that issue is solved once and for all. Now, this time he's going to take a, a different path. He's going to go on foot up from Antioch, 250 miles. It's going to take him more than two weeks. Imagine his mind is, is playing a, about what it's going to be like when he finally reconnects with them. He hasn't seen them in two years, right? He longs to see them again. He led them to faith. He remembers in Derby the diligent care that they gave to him after he was stoned in Lystra. The way that they protected him, the way that they nursed his wounds. As he comes over the edge and sees the city, as he sees them again for the first time, tears fill his eyes. As he hugs their neck, as they embrace Right, A pastor who has longed to see his people again. They have received his letter well. Okay? And in, in fact, Paul is elated to find out that, uh, that th they have received his letter well and, and the church has begun to flourish all through that area. That his his letter of discipline, it was stern, it was sharp, but they took it to heart and they have removed the cancer now. It has been expelled and the gospel is flowing through the region with a freedom. Okay, the church is exploding. There's such excitement. In Lystra, Paul's reunion with Timothy is on a higher plane. Timothy's father had passed away, and the young man clings to Paul, longing for a strength that he sees in Paul. Timothy has gained a reputation. He has become a leader. Since Paul left, he's gained a reputation. He's known in that region as a leader. And shortly after Silas joined, joins Paul in Galatia, Timothy will make it three I want you to think with me for a moment about Paul's legacy, how, how it encompasses so many different areas from his incredible theology, missionary journeys, his testimony before kings and governors, right? So as, as grandiose of accomplishments of all that Paul did, none is quite as impactful nor simplistic as his discipleship of Timothy. Think about that. Come with me, son, and let me show you how to walk with Jesus. Beloved, every one of us needs a Paul and a Timothy in our lives. What I mean by a Paul is you need someone who is more mature than you, a Christian who is more advanced that you can learn to trust and be vulnerable with, someone who can speak truth into your life, knows your weaknesses, knows how to call you out on your stuff, but you trust. 
You need that Paul in your life. And every one of us needs a Timothy. That is someone younger in the faith that we are pouring into, that we are discipling. The Bible tells us that we are to take the comfort that God gives us as we go through trials in life, and then we are to take that and give it to those who are going through the same trials later. Pass it along. So I want to ask you, do you have a Paul and a Timothy in your life this morning? And if you don't, would you pause right now and just pray and ask God specifically for that? Okay, there, there, there are seasons of life where, where people come in and out, but would you just take the next 15 seconds, don't listen to what I'm saying, and just pray that God would open a door for you to have a Paul or a Timothy in your life. Now, in the first five verses of Acts 16, Paul and Silas and Timothy now have circled back through this entire region, all through Galatia, and they have strengthened the churches. Look at verse five. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Verse six, there's a major transition. What did they do next? They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. You see, they've checked on all the churches in Galatia, and they are now standing on the edge. The, the frontier is in front of them. The gospel has never gone any further. Where do they go next? How does the Holy Spirit lead them? How do they know which way to go? Is God calling them to, to come back to Asia Minor and circle back around or to go up to Bithynia? Now think about this. Can you feel the weight of this decision? I mean, we're looking at it as far as history. Okay? This is the way the gospel is going to go forward and unfold and, and literally is going to shape the course of all of church history. What if they get it wrong? How, how do you know which way to go next? How do you discern God's will in your life? I want us to pause here, and I want us to, to spend some time answering this question. How do you make the big decisions in life? I promise you, we'll circle back to the text, and we'll, we'll unfold what happens in the text, but having dealt with college students for 10 plus years, okay, I want to give you wisdom and easy handles for how you are to make the big decisions in life. Okay, ready? If you want to take notes, there's going to be five easy handles to make decisions, okay? Knowing everything I'm about to say is covered in prayer. Number one, what does God's word say, okay? Does God's word speak directly to the issue or does it give wisdom in principle? And if God's word says it, that's it. Be obedient. Okay? If your question is, should I date or marry an unbeliever, guess what? You can stop praying. Okay? God's word has already spoken. He's not going to answer you any different from his word. Okay? No, you shouldn't become an abortion doctor. Okay? So, has, what does God's word say? That said, there are massive decisions in life that the Bible doesn't speak directly to. Should I stay in my current job? Should I start my own business? What schooling is best for my kids? When should I retire? 
then who should I let know that I have retired so that they leave my schedule alone? (laughs) You see, the Bible doesn't give specifics to every question in life. So what should we do? All right, number two, use your brain. Okay, God has given you reason, use it. So when I was having to choose between what job to take coming out of college, you know one of the things that I did? I made a T-chart with pluses and minuses, okay, for for each job situation and just began to list and to reason those things out, okay? Now, some of you need to hear me say this. God loves reason, okay? In fact, most of the decisions in your life, reason will win. This is called wisdom, okay? It's called wisdom in Scripture that God uses reason and logic and the Spirit of God shows you how to discern within specific situations. And guess what? This makes God happy and this is spiritual. Number three, seek wise counsel. What I call the Paul in your life. Someone someone who knows your weaknesses and will be able to, to speak into the situation and help you. So one of the job offers that I had was in Houston. But my family, uh, lived in Dallas at the time. And so I I sat down with that older, wise person in life, and we just talked and walked through. And he was able to speak at that moment and, and tell me, listen, I know you don't quite see things fully yet, but can I just tell you that being close to family, especially once you and Lane begin having kids, is actually a really big deal. And if all things else are equal, then you might as well be close to your family. Now, at that moment, that was wisdom beyond my years. And it greatly helped me sort through which path to take. So seek wise counsel. Number four, surrender your motives. Surrender your motives. This step is what makes Christians different from the world. The Holy Spirit of God is inside of you. He indwells you. And you are not your own. Why do you want to be a lawyer? Is it for the prestige? Why do you want to date him? Is it because he drives a really nice car and his parents are loaded? (laughs) Allow God to search the motives of your heart, okay? This is fundamental. And let me just say this, flat out, up front, okay? Be honest. We play such games with God as if he doesn't know it all. You play games with yourself, right? Do you really want God's wisdom and instruction? Then you gotta be honest, okay? You have to say, King Jesus, search my heart. See if there is any wicked way in me, and would you expose it, right? You just got to be honest. Why are you wanting to do those things, okay? And then number five, Surrender the decision. That means give the Holy Spirit the freedom to lead you. Now, this will either be by his peace and a confirmation and assurance that he gives in your soul, or it will be opening and closing doors. So one of the job offers that I had had a... $5,000, it paid $5,000 more than any of the others, and it came with a signing bonus. 
Now, when you are coming out of college, that's a big deal. That immediate money, you're like, oh my goodness, I could get out of a little credit card debt. That would be really nice. But one of the things I had to say, now, now hear me, the, money, the money's good. That certainly made the T-chart, right? The pluses and the minuses, that's why you work, is, is to have money, okay? So money is good, but one of the things that I had to do with God is just surrender and say, you know what, God? I'm not solely gonna take this job based on money. I give you the freedom to override the, the T-chart, okay? And I will go wherever you want me to go. Now, in this particular situation, the Lord led me to actually take the job that had the lowest salary because the boss was a very strong believer. Now, in God's providence, you see, I didn't know it, but in God's providence, you see, a year and a half later, he was going to call me into ministry. And that transition between the engineering world and and going to seminary, having a strong believer boss made all the difference in the world. And so in that situation, right, I, I, I had all these options in front of me and I walked through these five steps and I am telling you that the Holy Spirit of God gave me a Peace that was confirmation about which way to go. Because I'd surrendered all motives and I'd worked through all those things and in that situation, the Spirit of God gave me a peace. But guess what? I've been in lots of other situations as you go through life and I didn't have a peace. I didn't know which way to go. Okay? Okay? It wasn't quite so confirmed. What do you do then? All right, let's go back to our text, okay? Now remember, Paul has been called by the Holy Spirit, okay? Remember, set aside by the congregation and commissioned by that church in Antioch. So he knows he's called to go. But where? And how does God lead him? Listen to verses 6 through 10 as I read this. And they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they uh, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when they had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, um, in a moment, I'll, I'll show you a map so some of this makes sense. So, so they have gone through that whole Galatian region, and uh, immediately, Paul and his team, they're desperate to circle back down south to Asia Minor. Just calls it Asia here, but it's Asia Minor. And the reason is, is because that's where the largest population is. Okay? That's where the most people are. In fact, Ephesus is there, major city. Okay, And so Paul really is desperate and wants to go back down to Ephesus, to Asia Minor. But the Spirit of God stopped them. And then they tried to go north to Bithynia. And again, the Spirit of God stops them. And so they're forced to continue on and go to Troas. Now, Luke doesn't tell us exactly how the Spirit of God stopped them. So this is the Apostle Paul. And so 
maybe the Holy Spirit gave them an audible voice that said, stop going, don't go. I forbid you to continue to go, all right? If that's the case, it's only after repeated attempts, okay, to go into those directions. It's not like immediately. There are repeated attempts. That said, I don't read it that way. And mainly because when God does speak, it's really clear and it's with, and it's through a vision. And Luke tells you, God gave them a vision, told them exactly what to do. I actually read these attempts to go down to Asia Minor or to come up to Bithynia as doors get shut in their face. And as those doors are closed, later they're able to look back and discern, God stopped us from going. Okay? That's how I read those. So, those doors could have been closed by natural causes, like weather conditions, or human dangers, like robbers or those that hated Paul and were constantly persecuting them. Or economic reasons. Remember, they, they are uh, sub, they're, uh, trying to provide for themselves every city that they go. And so they attempt to come back to Asia Minor, door gets closed. They attempt to go up to Bithynia, doors closed. Now guys, this can be discouraging. To be trying to do God's will, and then suddenly doors are shut in your face? It reminds me of another particular passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he's telling them a little bit about his journeys. And in there, he tells them that Jesus opened a door for him to go to Troas to evangelize, Okay? So think about this because travel in the ancient world uh, took a long time. So for months, Paul has rearranged his schedule, got on a, uh, got on a boat, sailed across the Mediterranean, and gone to Troas. But 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 says, when I got there, I had an uneasiness in my spirit because I couldn't find uh, uh, Titus. He said, I couldn't find Titus. And so I left there and went and found Titus. Now, wait a second, Paul. I thought you said the Spirit of God opened a door for you to go evangelize in Troas. And if you're looking at this from the outside, it it looks like Paul doesn't quite know what he's doing. And he's bouncing around a little bit. Have you ever been there, beloved? Desperate to do God's will? You step out in faith and wham, a door slams right in your face. God, what did I do wrong? Guys, that can make us timid. And it can certainly make us play the victim. Right? You begin to look around at everyone else. Well, God, why did you open the door for her? What does he have that I don't? God, do you even want good for me? Now, sometimes when that door gets shut, you rise up and you're like, you know what? I'm going to kick down that door anyways. Or we run to the complete opposite end and say, then I quit. Then I quit. So many believers Right, sit and do nothing and say, I'm, I'm waiting on God to give me a sign. 
But Paul and Silas and Timothy, they don't do any of these, okay? They get moving and they trust that God is going to steer them along the way. And that God has the right, he has the prerogative to shut doors as they are journeying. Okay? They trust God in that. So here's the deal. After you get to the end of those five steps, it's time to step out in faith and to believe that your heavenly Father will steer you as you step out in obedience. Okay? As J.D. Greer once said, God steers sailing ships, not parked cars. Now, I've got a personal confession to make about this. Okay? That is that, I don't know if it's my personality or, or what, But there have been so many times in life when I've been paralyzed by the fear of making the wrong choice. And and the the way I have viewed these these choices that were in front of me, right? Let's say there's three doors there. One of those is the right door. And behind it is the blessing and favor of the Lord. But all three doors look the same. Behind number door, uh, doors two and three are pitfalls and peril. You'll get to the end of your life and you will completely end in the wrong spot. You will have wasted your life. And I'm petrified trying to discern the mysterious will of God. You ever been there? Do you view things like that? If that's you, can I just set you free this morning the way that the Holy Spirit set me free? Does that sound like your heavenly father who gave his son for you? Like it's all one giant mystery. I sure hope you picked the right one. If not, well, wah, wah, wah. Right? Right? Does that sound like your heavenly father? Is he going to hide himself and allow you to fall in a pit? What father would not answer a prayer for genuine guidance? Right? When you pray, God, I want your will. Would you open and close doors as you see fit? What father will not answer that and do it? You see, when a door gets shut, praise the Lord. Because he has his reasons. And when a door gets opened, walk through it with confidence because God is with you. And if there are multiple options and you do not quite know what to do, ask the Lord for wisdom and then go with confidence. Maybe both doors lead to the same spot on the other side. And God just says, you're fine. You can go. Either one. You do what is right for you. Okay? Have you ever thought that God is big enough and strong enough and smart enough to sort all of that out? Okay? That, that some paths lead to the same spot and he is going to work on your character either way. I realized that that I have this tendency, this constant begging for God to to map out my future, and then if he would be so kind, could you give me those plans, God? (laughs) Right? When in reality, he does not owe me a detailed plan of my life. In fact, he wants me to trust him to steer instead of follow a map. You know what you would do. You would just go where you, you would forget him. So you know how I pray now. I do those five things. I ask for his wisdom and discernment. And then I say, all right, God, 
This is what seems good and right for me. This is what I'm going to do. Please stop me if this is not what I should, but I'm going to start moving in this direction. I trust you. I trust you, God. So catch this in our text. Trying to go to Asia Minor, door closed. Try to go up to Bithynia, door closed. You can see it on the map here. It's, it's that shaded region, right? Try, try to come down to Asia Minor, door closed. Try and go up to Bithynia, door closed. They are seemingly forced to go to Troas because there's nowhere else to go. God keeps shutting doors. Now, there's this very small detail in the text that you might overlook if you're just reading regularly, okay? But do you know what happens in Troas? I know we're, we're going to get to the, the, the vision part. That's not the small detail that often gets overlooked. That, that's the obvious detail. There's a vision that happens when they get to Troas to come over to Macedonia. But catch this, the small detail the narrative goes from they to we. Verse 8, they came down to Troas. Verse 10, we sought to go into Macedonia. You see, in Troas, they pick up Luke. He's always so inconspicuous. He, he, he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. Okay, And we don't know if he was already a believer and joined them, but probably, most likely, they lead Luke to faith in Troas, and then he joins them for a portion of the second missionary journey. Guys, Luke was in Troas! Luke was in Troas, okay? The, the Luke who is going to write more than 25% of the New Testament, okay? This account we're reading, Luke, okay? Don't you love whenever you can see God's plans and purposes with clarity? Why were doors closed in Asia Minor, right? Slammed in their face. Why did doors shut as they tried to go up to Bithynia? God, what are you doing? We are just trying to do your will. Those doors were shut for Luke. For Luke. But we can't always see what God is doing, can we? And we get discouraged and confused. We want to call it quit when those doors are shut. But here you can see God was good. He was very good, unbelievably good through the shutting of doors because you see there was this magnificent historian named Luke. Beloved, is God for you? Is God for you? Romans 8, 31 and 32 if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Isn't he good? Then give him your anxious fear and trust him. Amen? Amen. You know what else happened in Troas? The dominoes started to fall, okay? Right, there, there's confusion and discerning the will of God. There's bouncing around. But once they get to Troas, the dominoes start to fall. God spoke clearly through a dream of Paul's. Verse nine, a vision appeared to Paul in the night and a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when they had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Okay, and then they're gonna get there, they're gonna go to Philippi and there's gonna be a woman named Lydia 
who gets saved, and she's a wealthy, widowed businesswoman, and she's going to show amazing hospitality and influence and provision that is going to propel them forward. You see, the dominoes start to fall. But I also want you to note, God didn't just give them the vision, go into Macedonia at the start. He waited. There was bouncing around there. Why? Because it's not about following a map. It's about following him. I want to close with this, with this quote from Paul David Tripp. And let me just tell you, Lane and I went through something personal this week that was just in line with this sermon. God is good and kind. And he gave us this devotional And it fits so perfect. And so I want to close with this. God knows what you are facing. He sees well the brokenness that is all around you. And guess what? He's not in a panic wondering how he's going to pull his plan off with these obstacles in the way. Don't be discouraged. God has you exactly where he wants you. He knows how he will use what makes you afraid in order to build your faith. He is not surprised by the trouble you're facing, and he has no intention of leaving you to face those things on your own. He stands with you in power and glory and goodness and wisdom and grace and he can defeat what you can't and he intends these troubles all right to not be enemies that will finish you but tools of grace that transform you what a word tools of grace that transform you will you pray with me our heavenly father king jesus We do declare that we trust you. We trust you with our whole lives. You are the sovereign king. You are the one who can see the end. And you have called us your own. And so in faith, right now we say we trust you. We trust you. You have saved us. And you have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So we trust you, God. Father, we do surrender this day to you. And we beg you, to give us wisdom and discernment and to steer us. Steer us all along the path of life because we desire to do your will and we have no greater joy than coming to the end of our lives and hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our church family, as the prayer team, uh, praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. However the Spirit of God has spoken to you today, I want you to be obedient and I want you to respond. There'll be ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you, would love to interact with you. If you came in with a burden, do not leave here carrying that on your own. We are a family. We carry these things together. If you want to use these steps or this stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord with an act of praise or obedience, I pray that you have the freedom to do so. Whatever decision the Spirit of God has laid upon your heart this morning, would you obey?